Thanks so much for coming. We hope you'll buy the book too. Thank you. <laughs> well, so how many of you have read every page of Lock and Key so far? Ah, uh, great. We're going to ruin the ending for the rest of you. Yeah. But it's the right route for that because as we're talking and as we're letting you all talk, I got a bunch of keys up here I'd love to give away. So we'll do some, uh, we'll do some lock and key trivia and you know have some fun. So I probably don't need to introduce the gents next to me, but Joe will get mad if I don't. So <laughs> please say a big hello to Joe Hill and Gabriel Rodriguez. It feels like it's harder and harder to get the guys together now, being, you know, Gabriel's down in Chile for much of his time, and Joe's you know, doing many other things. So I love the fact that we're all in this room, and we're all here with all of you. So again, I think we've all talked a lot about lock and key. Um, so I'd rather have it open to you guys to have you, if you want to start lining up and doing some questions, and just, uh, you know, let's just have some fun. The series just wrapped at the end of last year, so I think anything is on the table to discuss. And like I said, I'd love to just hear from all of you what you like what you hope to see, if we can pin Joe down to any, making any kind of announcement today, just <laughs> you know, yeah. whatever you want to talk about. There's the mic in the center, and so if you guys have questions and you want to line up, then we'll go ahead and we'll take them one by one, and maybe we'll get into the, the, the forthcoming um, Lock and Key My Little Pony crossover yeah. that we've done through, we're doing through IDW, <laughs> that we're that. very excited about. Um, maybe we can talk about, I, I can think of at least one cross, we can talk about some Lock and Key stuff that never happened. I can talk, <laughs> yeah. there's at least, there's at least the one. What if there is actually yeah. a really cool, okay, so you guys want to hear a really cool, like, just a totally random lock and key almost. Um, we were in talks um, for a long time and sort of had provisional permission yeah. to do a lock and key Sandman crossover. Wow. And, and the idea was, y'all remember the key to hell? The idea was that the locks would have created that key or a, uh, a duplicate version of the key and would unlock hell and it would be a story of Chamberlain Locke set in the past and he would have wandered through hell and then to the house of mysteries and the house of dream and he would have crossed paths with um, Morpheus and Lucifer and death and a lot of the and great Abel characters, and Cain and Abel and Cain and a lot yeah. of the great characters from Vertigo and it was one of these things where DC, DC said yes, we, you know, and, and and we were kind of, but, but we have a lot more ideas than we have time. Yeah. You know, we're like constantly coming up, wouldn't this be a cool key? Wouldn't this be a cool subplot and stuff? And we never really, somehow it never, we never really steered around to it and then we finished the series. Yeah, and the problem with mentioning things like that publicly is it just now feels like, oh man. We're not gonna be able to do this. Like we keep <laughs> yeah. it a secret, you know. It's like maybe this could still happen, but now but the that My it's Little out Pony, there, the My Little Pony crossover is yeah. a done deal. That's in the books. That's yeah. definitely going forward. And there's an image online actually yeah. that shows we'll a bit of that. We'll try for that to get yeah. approved. Uh, yeah. Yes. So the yeah. Pony goat. Questions? Go for it. Yeah. Okay. I know this is just a silly, a personal uh, opinion question. Which of you is the fan of uh, the band Riverside? Uh, say again. Of which, of which of you is the a fan of the band Riverside? Okay. Me, sir. <laughs> They're a great band. I just wanted to say because I noticed the, the yeah. little call out in the art, and I had to figure no, one, one of you guys. Of, what are you talking the... about? <laughs> <laughs> I know. This guy has no idea about music, but I got this to is say a that. Nickelback free zone. Before yeah, we go yeah. any further, we should clear that up right now. Kinsey was listening to one of the tracks on yes, her computer. Yes, of course. She had great oh. taste in music, so. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I, I needed to upgrade the character, and this guy gave me no bones, so I, I had to do it myself. So. Originally, originally he probably had a track from Rush in there, and I was like, no, nah, I'll walk from the comics like right now. You know, that shit's got to change. So he stuck in some other... Yeah, other. and then he get to his bathroom and start listening to Rush in his, in his iPod, not knowing anyone. So, yeah. Uh, it's you know, the, hardest the, part, the hardest part of the collaborative process over the years has been their music. You know, I can deal with their creative <laughs> impulses, but their, I mean, the stuff they like to listen to, particularly Rush, which is the most overrated band in the history of rock, yeah. you know, oh. except, I, I, maybe, heard, except maybe for the Doors, you know. Huh. Um, I've heard thing, uh, things like that about certain writers. Yeah. I'm not going to say names here. <laughs> that really was my only question. Okay. Thank you. Great question. Congratulations. <laughs> hey, I've actually, I've got a question for Gabe. Um, when it was announced that you were doing the Little Nemo yeah. books, um, I, I thought, like, man, I can't think of a single better artist to, to sort of update Windsor McKay. And, um, would you mind talking a little bit about 
um, visiting that world and how you've kind of been interpreting that world? Well, I remember a couple of years ago I discussed uh, ideas about doing something like Nemo in Chris Ryle's offices once I visited there and he had one of those big oversized books with the uh, Windsor McKay work. And then a couple of years later when we were finishing Lock and Key, they came up with the idea of doing this new Little Nemo uh, comic. And at that moment, I guess I was very stressed and delayed in my, in my, in my deadlines. And I immediately said very responsibly, oh, yes, of course, I would love to do that. <laughs> <laughs> and then a couple of weeks later, I met with a friend in Chile. And he told me, well, how does it feel to be working in the remake of the Citizen Game of Comics? And then I immediately get panicked and freaked out. But uh, it, it has been great. I, I love uh, McKay's work. I love that universe. I love that kind of stories also. I think th those kind of stories have been pushed away in recent comics, and I think we need to bring back that kind of imaginary and fantasy and gratuitous joy and magic to, to comics, and especially for new readers and for families to share together stories that can all, the, all of them read. Uh, for me, this is especially appealing since it's the first time that I will be actually have the chance to show my complete work to my kids. So that's uh, an improvement for me, at least uh, at personal level. And, uh, and IDW said the perfect team. I think Eric Shannon was the best writer that one could imagine for a project like this. And my fellow Chilean artist, Nelson Daniel, who's handling the color work in Nemo, is absolutely one of the, in my opinion, one of the top five uh, comic colorists working right now. So I feel blessed of the opportunity and hope to give my best and make it work. There's a preview of the book down at the booth. So if you guys come down for the signing or for whatever reason, come take a look and see what uh, Gabe's up to now. I've seen the pages, and I think it's Gabe's most beautiful and most wonderful work. I, I, and I think it's some of the most beautiful and wonderful pages I've seen in any comic anywhere in the last three or four years. You know, it's just absolutely, you know, I think people are going to be flattened by what he's done. How long are you slated to be on it? Hmm? Like, how much, how much of it are you doing? I'm going to do a four-issue miniseries right now, and we're going to see what happens after that. So cool. hopefully, if it, readers react positively, we're going to have more visits to Slumberland in the future. The Great. challenge with Gabe is that, that we want him to draw everything we ever do. So as much as we say, <laughs> Gabe, here's little Nemo. Please focus just on this. But could you also do this cover for a project we announced yesterday? A, uh, he's doing a cover for a Joe Hill one-shot um, for a series called Shadow Show. He did a cover for Edward Scissorhands. He just did a cover for Zombies vs. Robots. So as much as we want him to be able to focus on this new thing, <laughs> we also want him to be able to draw every single thing yeah. we do. So. Well, we want him to draw everything that we read. So yeah. <laughs> we're, we're even. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you very much. All right. uh, first, for Gabriel, uh, my friend back home, she's the one that got me into uh, reading this. And she absolutely loves your art and loves you even much. just how much it improved over the course of Lock and Key. Thank you, thank you very much. Now, as for a question, I suppose this is more to Joe. Mm -hmm. Are there any keys you came up with that you couldn't work into the story? And if so, is there any other story that you might use that idea, maybe not as a key, but the power that the key had? There was one, key, there was one key that was mentioned in one of the very first issues that allows you to change your age so that you can you can walk through a door and you can go from young to old and back again. And I always assumed I would find a story to stick that into, and, and I never did. Um, and, you know, we had a lot of ideas. Gabe and I both had a lot of ideas for, for possible keys and possible adventures. But in the end, we really wanted to keep the story tightly focused on, on you know, Tyler, and Dodge and Rendell and that sort of tragic triangle, um, and and you know we didn't want to take the risk of dragging things out for too long and yeah. sort of diluting the energy. Um, so we we really kept a tight focus. Um, one story I never wanted to tell. Uh, one story I, I never got around to telling that I wanted to tell um, was that um, Tyler actually uh, lost his virginity with his ethics teacher um, at Lovecraft Academy. Um, that's, that's true, and she's introduced casually as a character, and, and I had a story, and in my mind, that story actually happened. It just happened off screen. Um, but I thought it was sort of, there was some interesting stuff there I, you know, I wanted to talk about as well um, that I never got into. Um, you know, we may, there's, there's going to be some more lock and key at, yes. at you know, down the road. Um, we've got two stories for a book called The Golden Age, um, which is about a ha somewhat happier time in the history of Keyhouse. Um, somewhat, yeah. 
somewhat. <laughs> that's, right and now. that's the stories, the stories that have already been published in that are, are Open the Moon and, and um, right, that, uh, and. Grindhouse. Yeah, Grindhouse, right. Yeah. Um, and there's going to be, there's going to be um, a, few a few more of those to finish the book because I've got some, we've got some other short stories that we want to tell set between about 1905 and 1935 that should be fun. So we'll, you know, we'll get to, we will get to explore some of those other keys and possibilities. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks to you. Uh, let me let me give away a key here. I'll ask the same question I asked yesterday because I did it in an IDW panel and it, it fell really flat. So uh, in a bigger <laughs> room, uh, I imagine it'll fall could fall twice as flat. But <laughs> Gabriel's been with IDW for over ten years now. Um, what was the first book he worked on for IDW? Yeah, you. CSI, CSI absolutely. <laughs> Come on, Come on up and have a key. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let's sign it. Let's sign it. Yeah, let's sign it. The, the room yesterday was much more sort of broad IDW focus, so I figured that a room with lock and key fans would uh, would nail that one. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, go ahead. I just want to say yes, enjoy it. <laughs> the artwork is fantastic. I've never been able to be drawn into such a dark story with such vivid artwork. And I was just wondering if uh, it was, was it very difficult to kind of set the tone of the, the coloring and the, and the detail that you put into your artwork. And second question would be, if either one of you could pick a character from this, this wonderful story, which one would really represent how you felt while creating this story? Mm. Wow, good question. Well, yeah, that's a tricky question. Uh, about the, the artwork and the tone and everything, I, I have to say that it was a sort of unusually natural and and for me, it was very impressive. I'm a very obsessive guy, as Joe is. We are very obsessed with every detail of everything with us. We all always think that the things we've done are awful, and we mm. all see the mistakes all, all around all the time. But uh, I remember when I read the first script of Log and Key for the first time, uh, it was on the bus on my way home. And I started reading the script and immediately got pictures of the characters in my mind. I, I thought it has sort of magical and, and natural way of, of presenting the story awesome. that was very in tune with certain influences I, I, I got from my, my early readings as a comic reader when I was young. I read a lot of European comics. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I spent a lot of time uh, watching uh, special uh, mangas and, and movies like that. And, and I thought that there was a ground around that that was very appealing to the story that Lock and Key was telling. Also, it was uh, great for me that I received this story that was exactly the kind of project I wanted to do at that point in my life. I was a huge uh, a reader of Vertigo stuff from the early 90s with all the Sandman and Hellbracer stuff. So I thought that Lock and Key was my chance to try to do something like that. So I remember when Joe pitched the story and sent us these two sheets of paper in which one was a, a little brief of the main plot of the story and then another in which was a list of the nine main characters of the first arc described in three lines. And he told me, see what you can come up with this. And then I send you, I think, the, the sketches of the mm -hmm. first, the first sketches of the three kids and some lesser probably. Yep. And Joe immediately react very positively to, very positive to that. So it was great. I think in a way, Lock and Key came to us in the perfect moment and we immediately visualized what we wanted to do with the story. The thing which really gave me shivers was the first time I saw the house. Mm. You know, the first time he sketched the house, I was, you know. If, if there was a character in the story that I relate to in about how I felt when I was writing the story, it would, it would probably be Detective Matuku. Mm. Because he's sort of, you know, there are all these impossible events that he's sort of a borderline witness to. He's kind of on the outskirts of it. But he sort of implacably keeps picking at it, trying to make the parts all fit together. And that's, you know, for 36 issues, that's what me and Gabe both were trying to do, is to figure out how to elegantly make all the parts fit together in a way that made sense. So um, um, I always wanted to have a much bigger sword fight with him, too. Yeah. I really wanted to give Matuku a huge sword fight. And I implied there was going to be one. And in the end, about the best he did was kick a kitchen knife out of someone's hand. You <laughs> know, I, I got to say that sequence, you're right, it was complex enough to put it into a page. So thanks a lot. You didn't <laughs> wait <it> longer. <laughs> 
Between that and the mason jars, I still have nights. We get, you know, the thing is, is we get really spoiled because he can do anything and he makes it look so That's easy. That's what you think. Stuff. So then you're like, so then you're like, okay, in this scene, there are hundreds of mason jars tumbling <laughs> off the shelf, smashing to the floor. Each one has a separate little thought image inside of it. And, you know, you just figure, you can whip that together, no problem. Yeah. You get that, you get that, no problem. No, I, I realized when I was working in this in this comic that Joe had this uh, special ability when he sends you the script and tells him, don't worry, this page has only three panels. And then you read the panels and <laughs> are like Russian dolls in which you have like 11 panels set inside only one. And that's even <laughs> tougher to do, so thank you. The, you know, I also kind of feel a little bit like Bodhi, you know, when he unlocks his head and you can see the whole world inside. And in some ways, I also kind of feel like Lock and Key was like that. Like it was just like this whole world that swirled around in my, my head. And in Gabe's head, and you know, and in Chris's head, and stuff, and that it was, you know. So I also relate relate to him. Yeah, I have a I had a, a very special relationship with two poles that appear constantly in the comic, and one was of the kids, as Joe say. I think we all felt like Bodhi and at a certain point discovering this world, seeing what it was offering, and getting wondered by the the fancy and magic that was behind it. But on the other hand, for me, it was very appealing to work with the dramas and 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 uh, conflicts of some of the adult characters that were very, uh, at certain point, even exhausting to work with because they suffer so much. For me, mm -hmm. uh, working uh, certain parts of the story of Nina Locke and Ellie mm. Whedon were I incredibly hard for me to work because you felt them like real persons and you suffer with the suffering. And I remember when we were working in the last issue of Crown of Shadows, the story yeah. Beyond Repairing, yeah. which when N Nina Locke crashes at the end of that, that book, that was a, a terrible month to work in because you were staying constantly inside the head of this troubled woman, suffering like hell in that part, getting torn apart from her kids. And when you are a parent, to have your own kids and, and mm. get to relate with that kind of suffering, it's really hard. But in a way, I think it's a, it was a blessing for us to be able to, to tell a story in which we feel that the characters and their suffering were so real and, and appealing and incredibly the people react as readers to that in the same way. So it's, it was an amazing experience. I, I just want to throw out just as a random, totally weird lock and key piece of trivia. That story, Beyond Repair, which begins with 11 panels and then the second page is 10 panels and nine panels and eight panels and it moves in. So it shows how, how she's trying to use magic to pull her life into a cohesive whole and you get that one page. But of course, magic can't fix her problems. And so then as you continue through the comic, you know, you go back to two panels, three panels, four panels until in the final pages we're up to 10 and 11 panels and everything has been smashed beyond repair again. Um, that was actually written for the second book um, but then I felt like the, the script was complete and I had charts and stuff like that, but then I just felt like we would be giving away the location of the Omega key too quickly. Yeah. Um, and that it was too soon for her to crash that way, and so we wound up putting it off for the third book. But the cover, didn't we do in the second? You can sort of tell that it yeah. was aimed for the second yeah, book because, because the cover shows her head and the, the in fragments. In games, all the covers were shots of heads. heads. So yeah. we had this idea for the cover of the head of Nina Locke with the face getting turned apart and smashing into pieces. So and he, we had that drawn for the second book. He yeah. did it very early on, and then I, and then you know at some point I'm like, oh yeah, Gabe, we're gonna put that off for the third book. Sorry. <laughs> and then you know just to hit your last point on Jay Photos, the good thing about yeah. Jay Photos is that Gabriel had been working with him for a few years before that. Um, yeah. We first got them together on the Land of the Dead adaptation, and then the Clive Barker adaptation for 12 yeah. issues, and, and then Beowulf, Beowulf the book. and then another Clive Barker one shot. So there already been a couple good years of establishing a a color palette that really suited Gabe's art. But I, I thought it's important to single out Jay because he did every issue of not only all of those Gabe projects, but all of Lock and Key. And yeah. it was just a perfect partner on this book too. So I mean, the, it's, he's just as important in the book as everybody else. Yeah, the art of Jay in a way, I think beyond the, the fact that he colors the story, in a way he transpires lots of the emotional tone of the story into the coloring and also the environmental qualities of what's going on. I think is one of the few colorists in which you can tell if the, level of moisturizing the air that around the characters and you can mm. see that in the mm -hmm. color so i think in a way especially in what in which was to construct the the world around the characters in lock and key it w he was a key player jay photos made lovecraft become the town it was and key house became the the building it was because of his color work so we're very grateful and it was a blessing to have the chance to work with him all along this six year ride you're going to do another trivia question? Yeah, Thank you very easy. much. You know, you know, I, I sort of wish we had subjective trivia. <laughs> like, 
who is the best Judge Dredd? <laughs> and like, and like, you raise your arm and you can pick, but if you get Stallone. it wrong, if we're like, yeah, you know, if you're like, Stallone, or yeah. like, no. <laughs> you know, that would be kind of, there should be more subjective trivia. Well, the problem was, so I was trying to make these easy because I want people to win these things. I don't want to bring them back with us, but now I look at these and they're all, you're all going to know these things. <laughs> And we already talked what happens in panel two, <laughs> page seven? All right, on, on which newspaper cartoonist style was uh, Sparrow based? Yeah, over here. Uh, no, 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 you're, you're a journalist. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you're right, yeah. That's a key. We have a winner. Yeah. Now, don't write how I excluded you yeah. from this. <laughs> it's all on tape. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Joe, after working on a large body of prose work and now doing a large body of comic God, script sir. work, is there yeah. anything about the limitations or power or strengths of, of the comic strip medium, uh, comic script medium, that surprised you that you've discovered over the years? Well, I was a, you know, I have, so I do have these two lives. One, one life as a comic book writer and one life as a novelist and short story writer. But my life as a comic book writer began first. Um, you know, and that's sort of my natural, in a lot of ways, that's my natural home. Um, I was a failed novelist. I had written three books I wasn't able to sell um, over a period of 10 years and had, had almost pretty much given up on the idea that I was ever going to succeed as a novelist. Um, and, and, but I had written some short stories and the short stories had, one of the short stories had made it into a best of collection. And that short story, 20th Century Ghost, was read by a talent scout at Marvel Comics. And she got in touch with me and asked if I had any interest in writing about guys in tights punching each other. Um, and I got really excited. And I got excited for a number of reasons. I had always had a comic book imagination. As it happens, my very first professional fiction submission was to Marvel Comics. There was this book, the Marvel Tryout book. And if you were an artist, you were supposed to draw the last pages. And if you were a colorist, there were some pages to color in. If you were a writist, you were writer, you were supposed to write the end of the story. And when I was 12 years old, I wrote the end of that story and sent it into Marvel Comics, um, which they shockingly rejected. Um, <laughs> but but so so this talent scout got in touch with me and asked if I wanted to you know try my hand at Spider-Man. And I thought to myself, okay. I couldn't cut it as a novelist. I didn't have that in me. Um, but I know how to write a short story, and I could make the hero of any of these short stories a superhero as easily as an ordinary guy. And then, instead of playing for the, to the 200 people who read the High Plains Literary Review, I can get in touch with the 35,000 people who read Spider-Man Unlimited and I'll have an audience. So um, that was my first big professional breakthrough was Spider-Man Unlimited number 11 in, in 2005. And, and, and I was, uh, I mean, it was just terrible. I did, I totally choked. It was an awful issue, terrible story. But, but it pumped me up, you know, and made me want to write more comics. And, you know, growing up, all my favorite writers were comic book writers. It was Neil Gaiman and Alan Moore and Jamie Delano and, you know, Frank Miller and his early stuff. And, and um, so I was really charged up and really excited to, uh, to do more in comics. And that's how things got rolling. Um, so... Did I even vaguely answer the question? No, was I totally <laughs> off? Was I? We should point out on the Spider-Man story that, that whatever Joe thinks of the ride, and it was saved by some amazing artwork from Seth Fisher. Yeah, the, yep, the late and, Seth Fisher yeah, did. Yeah, and the lesson there is that if you pair Joe with an amazing artist, you're never going to notice if the story's maybe Sucks. not quite up to shot. <laughs> it's true. That's a, that is well said. It's true. It's true. So, all right, thanks. No, but uh, regarding that, I have to say that when I received the first script of Lock and Key from Joe Hill, they told me, well, this guy never written a comic book, and I just couldn't believe it. It was like the per pitch perfect uh, comic book uh, script uh, I've ever read, and I immediately realized it was going to be something big and a, a great opportunity for us to create something that will, will have a value of, of its own and would be special for people, so congrats, man. No, well. well, the funny thing is to say just you weren't you were a comic writer, not a novelist. I'm reading the pitch on this thing, and the thinking mm -hmm. in it was so far beyond what I see in comic book pitches. It was the thinking, it was the plotting of a guy who was a novelist who can see the entire arc and where he wants things to go. And it was it was just one of those things that went places and was so well thought out that I rarely see that in, in anybody in comics. Mm. No thanks. 
Yeah. And also you sold the idea that you were able to finish it in 12 issues if it was Six. necessary. Yeah. I said that when they, because they were going to adapt a couple short stories of mine, and then I'm like, no, 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 I got something even better. I got this story called Lock and Key. It's a great pitch. I can tell the whole story in six issues, and they bought that show. <laughs> you know, they're like, all right, sounds good. And then you get to a point where it's like, oh, shit, only 36 issues? What else you got? Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, far away. I was just wondering, during the collaboration process, were there ever times where you guys had disagreements about how the characters should react in like certain situations or the uh, direction of the story? Just about music. Uh, beyond <laughs> that, I think we agree in almost everything. Me and Gabe are like an old married couple. You know, I mean, he like finishes my sentences and vice versa, and we have like the same. We are like, we are like. He he is like he is like my brother in a lot of ways. We have like all the same thing, we think all the same things are funny, and we have all the same instincts about story, yeah, you know? I'm, and I'm starting therapy. The <laughs> I learned, I learned, I learned as much about the characters and the, you know, in, in Lock and Key from his drawings as he ever learned from me about, you know, stuff that I wrote. And you know, um, you know, I mean, it's a lot of, I think a lot of people think, well, I thought up all the ideas and then, Gabe drew the p pretty pictures, but it's not true at all. You know, as we went on, the process became more and more collaborative. And you know, um, in Lock and Key Alpha and Omega, um, Tyler makes a key, which he puts to dramatic use. You know, that was that was Gabe's concept. Gabe came up with it. We we um, at the time we were in Pittsburgh and we were hanging out. Yeah. We were in Pittsburgh for the filming of the Lock and Key pilot for Fox TV. Um, and the Lock and Key pilot is now enter the Lock and Key TV show is now entering its third hit season uh, yeah. in my imagination. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, the best part of being on the set was Gabe and I had this unbelievable stretch of time, you know, five nights yeah. to, to hang out in the restaurant at the hotel and, and make shit up. And we would just sit there and Lots talk and talk shit. and talk and laugh and like, you know, come up with ideas for keys and stuff like that. And, and you know, at one point, Gabe said, I don't understand why Tyler doesn't just make a key to unlock demons from souls. And I was like. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. No, I think in a way also about the, uh, uh, we, we, in a way, quickly get to a point in which the story start speaking to us. In, in a way, we get to a point in which the characters start behaving in the way they needed to be according to their own needs and impulses. So I think it was even, as time passes, it was even more difficult to find a point in which to disagree because the story was getting tied in, in itself. Yeah, well, we didn't, I mean, at a certain point, the characters come to life and we would never disagree because the characters are making their own choices and they're doing what they would obviously do in that situation. Um, you know, there's this whole, in Alpha and Omega, there's this whole thing where Dodge goes through this whole act of manipulation and deceit to get everyone to come down to the black door. But then at a certain point, I'm just like, all these characters would see through this bullshit. They'd never fall for it. And then I thought, yeah, and he'd probably get tired of it anyway. So at a certain point, he just, he just said, <laughs> all right, fuck it, let's go to plan B. And, and all the shadows came to life and tore down the cave and attacked everyone, and it was kind of, kind of like, yeah, that's what he'd do, it was great. You know, we never argued about any of this stuff because it was just what happened. The language does occasionally get a little salty in the room. Um, if, if, if you ever read the comic, um, and then you decided to bring your kids to this panel, you know, we're not on the hook for your bad parenting. Yeah. We can't be. Fair enough. All right, let's do, let's do another key. Yeah. So which character had the easiest time throughout the course of Lock and Key? Yes, subjective trivia. Yeah. <laughs> Who had an easy time? Who had the easiest time? Yeah, go. Uh, Bodhi? No. Oh, Nobody. my God, come on. He got he, possessed. He got... Yeah, but he seemed to enjoy it the most. <laughs> it's kind of a trick question anyway because nobody had an easy time. He tortured everybody, so... Yeah, you, yeah, you can have it anyway. Oh. Come on up. Okay. Then you can run back and ask your question. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> No, here you can realize that the editor never read the comic throughout the whole <laughs> run. I've heard great things, though. <laughs> you know, we've talked about, you know, speaking about our lack of editing on the comic, um, we've, talked about, we've talked about going back to fix, fix errors, you know, to do a kind of, you know, um, you know to George Lucas, the, the story, <laughs> and sort of go back and make yeah. it like we really wanted it. Um, you know, we got this character Jojo Banks that's yeah. going to be in the, in the <laughs> but, final version. But you know, 
<laughs> you know, and and because there are things, there are a couple places where I think, well, I mean, um, this is the kind of thing that only, like, probably only the people who worked on the comic would ever give a shit about. But like, in in the first six issues, there's a thing where the ghost door seems to lock itself. And I never really explained that or made sense of it, and I'm not even sure that's how the keys in Key House would work, so it's just a screw-up. It's just like this dramatic moment that means nothing, <laughs> you know? And so I thought, well, maybe we could go back and take that out. And so, but then I think, well, I don't know. I'm pretty happy with the series, and maybe it's good to just let the mistake stand, and, you know, that it's at a certain point, you, the, the writer and the artist have had their turn, you know, and it's just time to step back and stop fooling, mm. you know, and live with your mistakes, you know. You have to let it go, otherwise it would never get completed. It's uh, yeah, I it's never going to be perfect. Every time I watch the pages, all I see are the mistakes I think I committed in any single one of them. So you have to get to the point in which you have to accept it to let the story flow. And the story is the thing that's important. You have to put down your ego and, and realize that the thing you're doing is telling a story to share. So if you hold it to yourself for so many times, what's the point? He's ne he never made any illustrating mistakes, except, except at the end of um, Keys to the Kingdom, Kinsey was supposed to run up and give give um, Dodge a hug, and instead he has her run up and butcher her, him with an ice skate. Yeah. And I'm like, what are you doing? This is so <laughs> terrible. And but by then it was too late, and it was rushing to press, and we had to do it anyway. And it was a lot more. In my version, it was a lot more healing. <laughs> I bet. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, ever since I read the final issue, I've just been wondering. Are they going to forget everything that happened? That's a good question. <laughs> and yeah. how does it work with the adults? Because, you know, Nina's never going to forget her kid died. I, I think, think they're already forgetting. I think, I think by the end of the issue, they're already starting to forget. Because all these kids are just tipping over the point where they're not kids anymore. Yeah. And so we have this story about how maybe methane gas was getting loose down in the caves yeah. and causing people to hallucinate. You know, to hallucinate monsters, and it was really just a cave in, you know, a tragic cave in and stuff. And, 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 you know, you can almost see the grown ups starting to sell themselves on that. And you can almost imagine the teenagers, by the time they're in college a couple years later, having sold themselves on that too. I think all of them are forgetting. You know, the really interesting thing is, is I think probably Tyler forgets in yeah. a little while. And, you know, that's maybe that's another story. In a, in a way, I think one of the points of the story is that getting to the point that they become adults, they're going to forget through the magic or even to rationalize all of that. Mm. But I think what's interesting is that everything that happened to them make them the people they finally were. And I think that's the point of the story. After all this journey, they became something different, hopefully some an, an improved version of themselves. And that's the, the legacy that they are going to carry for the rest of their life. And that's the point of, of growing up. So I think that, that to get rid of the magical aspect, but preserving all the lessons they have learned in that journey is uh, what makes the point of the story. Thank you. Thanks. Um, is that an Altered Beast shirt? It is an Altered Beast shirt. Rise from the <laughs> dead. <laughs> Rise from your grave. So, um, I just finished reading the last issue of Wraith, hmm. um, and which was uh, totally unexpected. I, the, uh, <laughs> The last issue, uh, I was like, what am I reading The last here? issue of Wraith, this is this other comic that I did that's a spin-off of Nosferatu, and the last issue of Wraith, thanks. The, um, <laughs> it's, it's a story, it's not really a comic at all, it's more like a picture book. It's, yeah. it's a story with illu spot illustrations, and the artist on that was C.P. Wilson III. So, um, also in Lock and Key and in Wraith, and sometimes you have some very dense and intense character development. Yeah. That a lot of times, a lot of, um, writers that might tend to make something drag on, but I noticed in like in, in the first issue of Wraith, you tell an entire backstory without losing the uh, losing the reader at yeah. all. What's Thank your you. what's your what do you see as your process for cutting out the part of uh, character development that would you think would lose the reader? Um, my approach is sheer panic. You know, <laughs> it's always it's always terror. You know, I'm always afraid the reader will get bored and go load in YouTube and look at like funny kittens inside, like wine goblets and stuff. And you know, and or going to get the Wikipedia resume of the story. Yeah, you know, and I mean, it's just you know, it's it's you you just can't screw around. You know, it's got to. There has to be. 
there has to be a little explosion of awesome in every scene, you know? And that usually that explosion of awesome has to come from character. You know, it has to be a character where you're really interested, you, you see this person fully, and then they do something that's so perfectly them, it's funny, or it's horrible, or, you know, uh, or it's tragic. I mean, I think this is sort of the lesson of Joss Whedon's work. Well, I'm a big admirer of his work, and you know, when you think about how great The Avengers is, or Firefly, or any of his work, you remember these explosions of awesome. But it's never someone punching someone. Mm -hmm. You know, it's never a building collapsing. It's always someone saying something. You know, it's that one line where you're just like, oh my God, you know, that's, that's perfectly them. You know, and so you just do that. And the other thing is, is that the first, the first thing in storytelling that I ever really got was short stories. And that's all about, that's all about, you know, boom, 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 boom. Just, you know, click, 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 click. You know, there's gotta be a good scene, good scene. Where's my ending? Um, you know, short stories are one step above a joke. Um, and so you're looking for the punchline. How quickly can I get to the punchline? Thank you very much. Sure. We're gonna do another trivia. What do I have in my pockets? No. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to know. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Okay. All right. What was what was the best Star Wars movie? <laughs> who, wait. Who said the first? He gets a, he gets a key. Who who said? He said Empire Strikes Back, though, and that's the right, that's the right answer. <laughs> sorry. I mean, it's, it's Empire, obviously. Yeah, I mean, he, sorry. It's the Christmas special. <laughs> oh, yes. Bring it on. <laughs> oh, yeah, go ahead. Hi, guys. Thank you for creating Lock and Key, by the way. It was amazing. Um, I just wanted to ask... Um, what moment was hard for you to write, Joe, and what moment was hard for you to draw, Gabriel? Because, like, I'm not only, like, hard as in, like, fuck, I can't figure out what to draw or write, but, like, as in, like, this is emotionally, like, hard and, like, tense. Um, for me, like, it was, uh, to read, it was the moment where, like, Bodhi's telling Nina to, and Kinsey to stop fighting, and he's just drenched in tears. Like, that moment was just so intense, and it was hard for me to read. Because, you know, like, it just goes back to, like, personal stuff and all that. So what moment was hard for you guys? The hardest, the, there were two hard ones, but I don't think it's going to be hard. Satisf I don't think my answer is going to be all that satisfying. Maybe Gabe has a more satisfying answer. <laughs> Issue two of Welcome to Lovecraft was really hard to write. I did like 11 drafts or 12 drafts because um, I didn't know if I could really do it, and I didn't really know who the characters were yet. Um, and I knew I, I, the first issue I felt I had just totally come together and then I couldn't figure out what the hell was supposed to happen in the second issue and I just kept scrambling through variations and variations and none of it was right over and over and over again um, and eventually I had to admit to myself that the only character I really understood at that point was Bodhi so I made the whole story about Bodhi and his exploration of the ghost key in the well and then, and then used it to sort of start to figure out the other characters. I could see the characters through Bodhi's eyes so I could learn something about them. So there was that. And then I think that there was also an issue late in Head Games. Um, and I wrote it and Gabe was drawing it and I remember thinking, well, this is the first issue of Lock and Key I wrote that really sucked. You know, everything about it was bad. And then it came together and I felt like, you know, when we were getting ready to go to press and I felt like, mm, it's just not right. It's not. And then I had an idea to change, to change one panel. Do you remember we had a panel and then we swapped in mm -hmm. the drawing of them coming out of the cave? Yeah. You know, and yeah. it was like a flashback yeah. thing. And suddenly a really lousy issue turned into a really good issue. Um, and but and but that's that has less to do with how it was written, more with sort of like you know this frantic moment of panic, and then getting an idea, and Gabe being able to say, yeah, I can do that, even though we were like right up against the deadline, even though it was going to press like the next day. He's like, yeah, I can do that. Yeah. So, uh, well, for me, uh, well, by far the the toughest character to work with in the series was the house. Uh, I had, I, I am an architect by training before being a comic artist. So when we started working in Logan Key, I got this idiotic idea of make the house an actual architectural project that may be functional. So I designed the whole blueprints of the house and made a 3D model and everything, and then I cursed over that in the rest of the series. But uh, I think in a way it contributed a lot. I, I remember when I read the pitch, I immediately realized that the house was going to be a character in the story, and in a way it's going to be the, the, the one that carries the heritage of the Locke family throughout the ages. So 
we have this idea of making this house that's going to be a mixture of different types of architecture that will reflect the evolution of the family throughout the years, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And uh, it finally came out pretty well. So it, it was uh, one of those things in which you sweat a lot, but then it pays off uh, big. And of the actual characters, the one that I, I love working with all of them. And in, in a way, it was a, a, a very intense process all these years sharing my daily routine with these characters. And I have to say the only one that was a really nightmare to draw was Scott Cavanaugh. Because mm -hmm. Joe had this great idea of him having his body filled with tattoos that I started doing with this sort of Celtic inspired design. And then I realized, oh my, I have had to draw this guy over and over from different <laughs> angles. And the tattoo has to match. So that was, uh, I had to, every time I draw Scott, I had to have six or seven sheets of paper with him printed in several points of view to not mess with the design of his body. Yeah, you are the sign, yes. Thank you, thanks Thank so you. much. Okay, what's the scariest Doctor Who episode? Who, who called? Weeping Angel, she gets it. Yeah. yeah <laughs> <laughs> well, it is called Blink. It is. Okay, give her, give her a key. Okay, yeah, she yeah, said yeah. Blink. Okay, <laughs> all right, okay, all right. <laughs> yes, you can show me this. That would be great. Oh! He's so mysterious. Yeah. <laughs> Don't take anything out of his head. There you go. Thank you. <laughs> go ahead. Hi. Uh, I really like the story. And um, so one of my favorite characters is uh, Rufus. And yeah. so I was just curious if you could shed any light on um, why he doesn't have the keyhole in the back of his head and why he can see Bode when he's a ghost. Um, or if I missed it. Because I think, I think I was trying to suggest that, that there is something fundamentally mysterious about the thought process of the autistic and, and people who have Down syndrome. Um, and so I wanted to suggest that, that what's often looked at as a disability um, in, this one, in this one case could, could make him unusually powerful and, and dangerous to Dodge and that Dodge might not see that because Dodge can reach into other people's heads. He can use that key to manipulate people. He can lie and deceive, but he can't fool Rufus. Um, he can't manipulate Rufus, um, and, and Rufus's mind is a kind of closed space. Um, um, so I, I knew it's in, it's in his nature. He yeah. is, uh, he's by himself different, and, and that protects him from the schemes of Dodge. I, I knew that I knew pretty early on that at the oh. If you haven't read the last book, you might want to go ah, <laughs> just for a second, um, because I'm going to give away something about the ending, something pretty big about the ending. Um, I knew I knew pretty on, early on that Rufus was going to finish off Dodge at the end. That Dodge Dodge just was too arrogant to see that Rufus was the was real was the real threat yeah. to him, because he knew the truth, um, and because his basic decency couldn't be warped. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Hello, uh, thank you for the books. I enjoyed them very much. Uh, one of the things I really appreciated about this story was the fact that the events unfolded over time and many generations. And I was just wondering when you guys were plotting things out, what came first? Was it the origin story you know, of the keys? Did you start with the present day with the kids and how was that all plotted out? We, um, at first, I was just, for the first three or four issues, um, I was just flying by the seat of my pants, and then um, just making shit up as I went along. <laughs> and then, and then um, at a certain point, I had a chance to ask a question of Alan Moore in an interview. And I said, how important is it to know your, the answers to your mysteries um, you know, when you're going into a story? And he said, you know, really only you know, a total asshead would, would set up mysteries they don't know the solutions to. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so at that point, I created a Bible with, and Gabe and I talked about it. And over the years, at first the Bible was really big and it explained how everyone got everywhere. Yeah. When we eventually told that story in Clockworks, though, yeah. a lot of um, unnecessary material just fell away, like, you know, just... But it, it was very few. I think, in a way, in, the, in that short story, in a way, Joe constructed the whole story of Randall and his friends which was to be the, the, my, the, the founding stone of the story that their kids inherited. So 
uh, it was very helpful, and I think all the core elements of, of that planning uh, appeared later in, in Clockworks, mm. indeed. Yeah. I, I, was, I remember working on Clockworks, and I had the, all the other books annotated because I was scared we would miss something and everyone would catch us at it. Um, but, but that didn't happen, and, and also Gabe is as you know, detail-obsessed as I am, and I don't think he would have. I don't think he would have let me miss anything. He would have. He would have caught me out. Um, right, we have minutes. five minutes, so we're gonna go into the speed round. Yeah. Best Marvel movie. <laughs> oh, <right>. totally. <laughs> I would have also accepted Captain America too, but okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, winter. Yeah, winter. Okay. Hey, yeah, Joe. Gabriel, big fan of the book. I mean, I'm, I'm also a big fan of Horns and Nosferatu. Um, absolutely, I can't. I can't wait for the movie to come out too. Um, question. Um, I really love Sam Lesser in, in, in Lock and Key, and I was wondering, I was really drawn to his, 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 his sadness and his, and his violence and his senses. Oh, yeah. And I really w would like to know where you came up with that character. That's where the story begins. That's the, the original genesis of Lock and Key is I wrote a book. I, said, I mentioned earlier on that I had written three novels that I was never able to sell. One of them was a book called The Briars, and it's about a long, hot summer where there's <coughs> this young... Um, gifted um, but disassociated young man, miserably unhappy young man, um, who falls in with a thuggish older boy named Al Grubb, and this young sort of genius who has no uh, no other friends and no real emotional inner life, um, and his name was Sam Lesser, and the two of them go on a killing spree in a small New Hampshire town um, one summer, and they kill like seven people in two days. And, and so I wrote this book, and it wasn't actually all that good a book, but the relationship between Sam and Al was interesting. So they became sort of the opening of that first issue is basically like part of the Briars. Yeah. Um, the funny thing is, is talking about mistakes, sometimes I think maybe the story didn't really need Al Grubb, that he was kind of like, you know. Uh, Nina Locke would agree with you. Yeah, I know. Sorry, yeah. Um, okay, so here's a question for you. So here's a trivia question for you. Um, um, who played Nick Fury oh. before yeah. Sam Jackson? <laughs> I heard him first. Yeah. <laughs> Great, next question. Thank you. Uh, thanks for everything, guys, and I'll keep it quick. But uh, we went specifically to the Visionary Showrunners uh, panel just so I could ask Bob Orsi and Alex Kurtzman what the status is. And you mentioned the pilot. Yeah. Um, the last I heard about it, that you guys were working with them to possibly bring a movie or a trilogy. Yeah. Can you talk about... Um, Alex Kurtzman um, and Bob Orsi um, produced yeah. um, this great pilot, which never aired, unfortunately. We did air it here at San Diego Comic-Con a few years ago and then New York Comic-Con, but... Um, maybe some of you got to see it. I don't know, but it, came, it turned out really well. Unfortunately, Fox went with Alcatraz instead, and so that's ancient history. But yeah. um, you know, and Alcatraz, I believe, is in its third hit season. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> now, um, in someone's imagination. But yeah. the um, um, Alex Kurtzman is very devoted and, and and has pushed really hard for Lock and Key, and yeah. he was able to bring the rights over to Universal. Universal would like to do it as a as a trilogy. Um, they have a screenwriter working on it who has this idea, of, he has a, apparently has a really clever way to knit together two books um, in each film, um, which I think is sort of intriguing and I don't know if it will work, I'd have to see the scripts. Um, but what I have heard is he's delivered at least the first half of the script and, and, and everyone who's seen it was kind of blown off their feet that it, they thought it worked really well. That's, on, that's only hearsay, but I also think that knowing Alex, um, you know, if the script really stunk, what he would have said was not, it was brilliant. He would have said, it was really good, I gave him some good notes, yeah. you know, yeah. which is like code for total train wreck, um, but we're gonna save it anyway. Um, but no, he seemed really inspired and excited, so I do have hopes that, that you know, there will, be a, um, there will be a film from Universal in a few years. You awesome. never know if these kind of things get to happen or not, especially movie business things sometimes change o overnight from uh, going to production or dying. But uh, what we are very comfortable about is that the people that's involved in, in trying to develop this project really love the original source material and they are passionate about the story and the character. So we're pretty confident that if they manage to make it happen, probably it's going to be pretty close to the spirit of what the original book is about. So Perfect. that's what we hope for in case it works. Awesome. Thank you so much. No, thank thanks you. to you.